Our topic this evening is Holy Wisdom and the Logos. And so what we're talking about here are conceptions of the divine existing within Judaism prior to Christianity's uh, emergence and separation from Judaism as a, a different religion. Um, we've talked many times about the complex conception of God embodied in the Christian idea of Trinity, viewing God as being one God with a single essence, who nevertheless exists in three separate persons or hypostases, which are themselves dis totally distinct from one another. So where do they get that idea come from? We're going to look at pre-existing ideas uh, that are both precedents within the Hebrew Bible, but also within Second Temple Jewish thought at the time Christianity is emerging. So holy wisdom. So we're most famous, sorry, we're most familiar with the Greek uh, whole of that name, Hagia Sophia, uh, because of the amazing church built by the Emperor Justinian in Constantinople in the 6th century. Um, it was a monumental feat of uh, later Roman engineering, and Hagia Sophia became the largest cathedral in the world for a thousand years, the largest uh, building by t in terms of enclosing interior space for hundreds of years. Uh, and it is dedicated to holy wisdom. Holy wisdom um, has an iconography, both in Eastern Christianity, where Hagia Sophia is the central church, but also making its way in the West. And so here are two different images of holy wisdom and her three daughters, faith, hope, and charity. Um, and so you can see, uh, again, this is an idea of the divine, but also the divine feminine, since wisdom here is understood as a female, as a mother, and as a mother of other concepts that are important in Christianity. Um, Hagia Sophia in Christianity, then, is the wisdom of God personified, and because the word for wisdom in Greek, Sophia, is feminine, Sophia becomes a kind of a rare, relatively rare, portrayal of the divine feminine in Christianity. So, given that the portrayal of God in Christianity is already complex, as we talked about the Trinity, one God, three persons, how does Sophia, holy wisdom, the wisdom of God, how does that relate, how does she relate to the one God? And so, I'm going to let you take a moment to guess <laughs> what the relationship is. A minority of Christians have identified Sophia with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. So some Christians do, most do not. Um, this identification could work or would have been interesting, um, I think, in terms of actually giving some shape to the Holy Spirit which is sort of a nebulous, much more nebulous, I think, as far as in Christian thought in general than the first two persons. So I think that um, Christians have a pretty, have spent a lot of time thinking about the Creator and have spent a lot of time thinking about Christ and the Logos and have spent less time thinking about the Holy Spirit. We, um, in our uh, uh, lecture on Arianism, we mentioned how the original Nicene uh, Creed had a lot to say about um, uh, God the Father, the Creator, but and way more to say about Christ and how people understand Christ and how people should not understand Christ. And at the end of condemning all the Arian um, ideas of what Christ may be and what Christ and, and claiming other ideas about what Christ is, they just come to the end and say, and we also believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and they don't have anything more about the Holy Spirit. It's a complete afterthought. Um, and so uh, that, I think, is often still true. 
And as I uh, was preparing this lecture and even thinking about this, I need to myself put a lot more thought into how I understand the Holy Spirit. I have a couple shorthands that I use, but I, th I would like to think about that more fully because I've spent more time thinking about the Creator and about how we understand Christ. Spirit um, is feminine in Hebrew, so ruach, that's a feminine word, but spiritus, where we get the word spirit in English, spiritus is masculine in Latin, and then pneuma, the word uh, for spirit in Greek, is neutral. And, and I was trying to think of how we have the usage, I think in a bunch of our hymns and how people will talk about the Holy Spirit in my church when they're talking about that, I think that, that we will usually talk about the Holy Spirit and use the word it. So again, we're using neutral pronouns or neuter, neuter pronouns. The, but in English, unfortunately, you also have the idea, uh, it seems, he seems masculine, she seems feminine, it seems objective. In other words, it's not a, like an animal like a dove or something like that, as opposed to a, a being who is, let's say, a thinking god or something like that. So it's a little bit complicated. So some, like I say, uh, Christians have identified Sophia as the Holy Spirit or part of the third, with, equating holy wisdom with the third person of the Trinity. Um, and some Russian Orthodox thinkers over the last few centuries have kind of really um, uh, gone all out with this. So there is a um, component in Russian Orthodoxy called Sophiology, which is sort of like Christology. So in the same way of understanding uh, Christ, now this is understanding wisdom, which may seem to introduce wisdom as a fourth person of the Trinity, uh, and a fourth hypostasis of God, which if you're counting Trinity, I think that's one too many persons from my perspective. Um, uh, other, were, other formulations connect wisdom with the Theotokos, the mother of God. There is a scripture in Luke where, referring to John the Baptist and himself, Luke, uh, Jesus says, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. And so maybe this is an idea that Jesus is a son of wisdom, and Jesus' mother is the Theotokos, the mother of God, in other words, Mary. Again, that connects up some Christian aspects of the divine feminine, but it really makes the, um, the idea of God too messy, too many persons now, once we have Mary and wisdom in, in this uh, what's community of persons, I think. So the majority position of Christian thinkers from the beginning identified holy wisdom with the logos, which is to say the word of God, and thus with the second person of the Trinity, Christians understand to be Christ. So, as we've said, given all of the emphasis on God's oneness, on being monotheist that we have in Abrahamic religions, in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, how do Christians arrive at these complex conceptions of God existing in multi I'm sorry, multiple persons? So we have our traditional uh, diagram here that's explaining one God who is the creator, who is the logos, who is the spirit, whereas the creator, though, is not the logos, the father is not the son, the spirit is not the logos, the spirit is not the creator, and so forth. So, one of the things we should note is, um, even though humans usually believe that God does not change, human conceptions of God continually change and develop over time. And this shouldn't surprise us. Sometimes people think, well, that means that uh, if people in the past who uh, are thinking about God and making up ideas and writing down scriptures and so forth about God, if their ideas are, let's say, more primitive, if they uh, don't have a, a sophisticated an idea, then, then obviously that means there is no God. Whereas what we can maybe say is that human ideas evolve over time in the same way that um, in the past philosophy is maybe more primitive than it is now. Likewise, certainly um, physical science 
understanding of physical science was vastly more primitive in the past. That doesn't mean that um, these sorts of uh, concepts are not, not, not uh, legitimate, but rather it means that it's a process of learning and developing and growing. So in general, what I'd say is as the scale and understanding of the cosmos of creation expanded in antiquity, ideas about the source of order and meaning, ideas about the divine, whatever is behind all of the, this cosmos that everyone is perceiving and learning about, those ideas grew ever more sophisticated, uh, more grand, and more remote from the day-to-day -day human experience. But then more recently, the modern rise of fundamentalism um, has, has taken that abstract uh, idea of God that was had uh, in ancient and medieval historians and theologians, theologians and philosophers, I meant to say, um, uh, now in the hands of uh, modern fundamentalist uh, churches and, and uh, sects of uh, Judaism and Islam and other fundamentalist religions, um, that has left people with a smaller, more literal conception of God where um, many people who grew up Christian um, really think that God looks just like this picture of a bearded guy, uh, more or less as a giant um, sky grandfather uh, uh, and, has, and as your literal dad in a way, in a way and so forth. Not, um, not what uh, Christians have taught throughout history, but is what, more or less uh, what people believe now because of uh, having churches that are not particularly theologically grounded, but instead um, have been focused on a common sense or literal reading of the Bible that is uninformed by um, scholarship of what the Bible actually is. So significant development in the idea of how to define God, what is God, who is God, took place during the centuries in antiquity when biblical texts were being composed. And as a result, the Hebrew Bible, because it's written over many, many centuries by many, many different peoples, presents multiple contradictory conceptions of God. Uh, dialogue, the dialogue continued then in the works of Jewish Apocrypha that did not make it into the Bible, as well as in Christian texts, including those texts that were eventually combined to form the New Testament. And so already in the Pentateuch, when we have, uh, for example, God appearing to Moses uh, in the form of a bush that is... Uh, burns but is not consumed, uh, and it's just understood that that's a sign, that that's God's presence, indicating God's presence, but not actually what God physically looks like because God is not physical. Moses hears the word of the Lord from the bush, but is not actually seeing a physical body of God. This is already um, an attempt by the authors of the Pentateuch, of the five books attributed to Moses, the Torah, to avoid anthropomorphism. So if we consider um, the biblical edifice, as I would call it, let me get a glass of water. <clears throat> the biblical ed edifice as it's told in the Bible, if we go from the creation through the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, we have a, a, a story that is telling about, telling about the fact that there are prophets and then later good kings who were always monotheist, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, who are uh, attempting to hold on to and get the people around them to continue to worship the one God and understand that there's only one God. But meanwhile, throughout... Uh, the history, or the stories anyway, was presented as uh, eras in the Bible, as history in the Bible. There is a turning away from God that leads to increasing polytheism, so their worship of the many small g gods. 
Uh, and so over time, polytheist rebellions only increase, and that ultimately is the cause of the destruction of Jerusalem, according to uh, biblical authors. However, so that's the story, that's the way things are presented the, in, in the Bible. However, as we've seen, um, the reality of actual history is that ancient Israelites began uh, as polytheists. They were undifferentiated from their Canaanite neighbors who worshipped a multitude of gods, just like all of the other pagans of the ancient world, and that there is a tiny group of Yahwist prophets and Zadokite priests, ultimately Davidic kings, who reformed their traditional polytheistic religion and introduced what we call henotheism, which is to say, um, yes, there's more than one God, but we're only going to worship one God. And that increasingly, you know, that reform became more and more important uh, and was especially established by the time Jerusalem was destroyed. But through most of the period, in fact, and especially from the beginning, um, all of the people were, when we say pagans or polytheists. So that's the actual history. And so, read literally, the Bible presents a pyramid that is upside down in relationship to the actual Israelite history. Why would that be? Well, this is because the texts are written at the end, or edited at the end, by henotheists and later actually true monotheist reformers. And so the reformers, uh, like all religious reformers or people, almost all people uh, founding a religion, they seek to portray their own innovations, their new ideas, they want those to be considered, well, no, these are the actual ancient practices. This is how God set everything up at the beginning. And all of the really ancient practices, the traditions around us, those are being portrayed or misportrayed as, re as the recent in innovations. And in the Bible, um, this paganism or polytheism is often blamed as introduced by foreigners. In other words, you're taking on and starting to believe foreign gods. And the people responsible are people like Jezebel, so when kings marry uh, foreign queens, they bring their gods with them. In point of fact, the, the actual reality is, is that the, the Israelite people had multiple gods that they were worshiping, and the reformers were trying to get them to stop that. And so um, that's the innovation. And that happens all the time. So when we, um, when we see the foundation of Islam, Islam is not um, identified as a brand new religion, rather. Um, the pretense is that everybody had always been Muslim, but the, the Arabs had uh, you know, fallen into paganism and so forth, uh, and they were, this is a restoration of uh, what was understood. And so um, the Kaaba, which is a, had been the pagan temple in, in, in Mecca, is re, repurposed historically. It's given a new history. Um, a legendary history and said that Abraham founded it as an, a temple to or a shrine to the one God and it was only later polluted by, um, by at the addition of pagan shrines. It's actually always a pagan shrine and, and it's now changed. The same thing happens in um, my own church's history. So we call our movement the Restoration because we're claiming we're not a new church. We're just organizing the Church of Christ that had existed back in Christ's day, but had fell into disorganization, and now we are reorganizing it and creating that same, not creating, but we are just beginning again that same church anew, because it is not a new church. We're the same church. Um, you know, and the Renaissance is the same way. So the Renaissance, they claim that they're just simply reviving um, classical tradition that had ceased to exist during the Middle Ages, so history had fallen off the tracks, and now this is a rebirth of it. That's something that people, people like to do. Uh, in order to get legitimacy. So, shouldn't surprise us then, because there was an evolving conception of Yahweh in ancient Judah, that therefore there's going to be different portraits uh, in the, embedded in the Bible, depending on uh, how uh, Yahweh or Jehovah is understood by the people at the time. So, like I say, the very earliest footprints 
Um, the Israelites are polytheists. In other words, Yahweh is just simply one of the gods who is worshipped alongside many other gods. The bulk of the biblical writing, uh, we get to monolatry or henotheism, where Yahweh is the sole god to be worshipped among other, among other gods. So in other words, we're not denying that the other gods exist, but we're saying that uh, we should only worship uh, the one god. And then ultimately, uh, there are later writers and editors who once, uh, once Israelite religion in the Second Temple period has gotten strictly monotheist, uh, who assert that there's only one God and all of the others are idols. So early reformers introduced henotheism among polytheist Israelites, producing a religion that later develops on its own or evolves into monotheism. And so we have some of these footprints of the earliest uh, components. For example, the Song of Moses, which is a text embedded in the book of Deuteronomy, which most scholars identify as among the earliest texts of the Bible. This has a poem, or this is a poem, that talks about Yahweh as one of the sons of El, one of the sons of God. And so it says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. When he divided up the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of El. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. And so uh, El, who's the father of Yahweh, gives and, uh, to, gives, divides up the people of the world, gives Israel, Jacob, to Yahweh, and then gives other people like the Ammonites to uh, Malcolm and so forth, the Moabites to Chemosh and, and the Philistines to Dagon and, that, and, and so on and so forth. Much more of the Bible is henotheist. And so, for example, the Ten Commandments uh, in their most popular for, uh, formulation in Exodus 20 express kind of a henotheism, the idea that although many gods exist, a particular group should worship only one of them, or our particular group should worship only one God. And so God, speaking to the people here and giving them commandments, say, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether it is in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth below, or that is in the wa uh, water under the earth. So, you know, the stars that most people worship, everybody else is worshiping as a god, that is not, uh, you don't make a, something about the sun and the moon and the stars uh, because you're, on, you're not going to make idols of those other gods or uh, even embodying me. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So, Yahweh then, in this era, in this conception, is a god among the other gods of other nations. And so Yahweh is, uh, by form of these reformers, the sole god among the other gods to be worshipped. And Israel then is a distinct people chosen by a god, Yahweh. And some biblical authors number Yahweh among the national gods of Israel's neighbors, in other words, henotheism. And so the Philistines are the, have the, as their god, Dagon, according to the Bible, this isn't backed up in archeology span for the Philistines, uh, the way that Moab's god, Chemosh, is backed up by the um, Moab stele, so an Ammon for Malcolm and so forth. Um, other biblical writers assert that Yahweh is not, it's not just that we're only to worship Yahweh and that there are other gods, but that Yahweh actually is the greatest among the gods. And so that's kind of the difference between henotheism and monolatry, right? Where we're saying, we, our God is the best. And so, and so we, it doesn't mean there's not other gods, but ours is the best. So the development of true monotheism, it's a later evolution in the Hebrew Bible. For example, it's expressed in Deutero-Isaiah. So this is an anonymous 6th century BCE. In other words, from that post-exile period after the Babylonian captivity, this is a continuer who is pretending to be Isaiah and writing as if they were the original 8th century BCE prophet, but 
um, writing much later and introducing anachronisms so we know that it's not the original text. And so this Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. You are my witness. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. So this is denying, um, it's not I'm jealous of all the other gods and don't worship the other gods. It's there aren't any other gods um, we're now, we've now gotten to. So when you do that, when you have a national god, Yahweh, and then you assert that your god is god and all the other national gods don't exist. So Dagon, Malcolm, Kamush, those are all just false idols. We get to a, um, one of the possible logical conclusions is a kind of a problematic provincialism. So in other words, we have a universal God who is the God of one people only. So Israel becomes God's one and only chosen people. And then the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Moabites, they are all peoples that are rejected by God. And so this is what I call chauvinistic provincialism. Other biblical authors though understood that if Yahweh is the one and only supreme God of the universe, and there are no other small g gods, then God must be the Lord of all humankind, even though they um, know God through their uh, particular um, interactions with God through Israel, through Yahweh. So uh, in Jeremiah, God says to the prophet Jeremiah, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. So asserting a kind of a universal monotheism in addition to, um, in addition to uh, the universality of God. So, as the conception of Yahweh evolved during the biblical period, from polytheism to monolatry and henotheism to monotheism, God's portrayal also evolved from a more anthropomorphic or human-like fleshy God to a more cosmic infinite, giant, uh, grand kind of God. So starting with uh, the Yahwist author in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, we're presented with a pretty anthropomorphic picture of God, Yahweh, who, for example, breathes into Adam's nostrils in order to bring the dust to life, and the same God who goes, uh, plants a garden in Eden and goes walking around in the garden, and, in, and indeed isn't, isn't sure where um, Adam and Eve are when they're hiding from him. Um, the same God shuts the door of Noah's Ark, shutting him and all the animals into it. And when Noah comes out at, at, on dry land and offers a sacrifice, he smells Noah's sacrifice. In other words, it's a kind of a fleshy, human-like, anthropomorphic God. Um, in Exodus, uh, we start to have a a portrait of um, a God whose face is too mighty for mortals to see. So the Lord tells Moses, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And he clarifies, um, you shall see my back. I'll be standing on this rock and you can see my back, but my face shall not be seen. After Moses receives the law on Mount Sinai, his face is changed such that it says, quote, the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. And so some kind of like light is beaming from his, his face and you can't, you know, so the, the glow of that had been on God has now been transferred enough to Moses that it uh, is affecting him and how you're seeing him. And um, this idea that there are rays shining from his faith, face is mistranslated um, in Latin, in the Latin Bible, as horns. And so as a result, there's a lot of depictions in the Christian West uh, of Moses with horns because um, it's talking about him being horned after this. But essentially what it means is that his face um, is shining as opposed to actual horns. The children of Israel see God as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they're not seeing God as a um, human-like being that is walking around with them. Job, the prophet, hears God speak to him from a tornado. Um, the prophet Elijah, by contrast, 
Although he witnesses a mountain-breaking wind, an earthquake, and a great fire, he only hears the voice of God in the sound of sheer silence. So these are visions of God that are not anthropomorphic. So while the children of Israel do not see God directly, they frequently witness what's called in the text, the glory of the Lord. And so this is just, a, uh, there's plenty of these. I'm just excerpting a couple examples. So while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of God appearing in the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So um, these are examples of essentially you can't see God, but you can see the glory of the Lord. This is the formula. Um, later exilic prophet, uh, exilic period prophet Ezekiel uh, indicates that he's seeing the glory of the Lord in his visions. And he uses this phrase, I see the glory of the Lord in several, several occasions. The very beginning of his um, explanation of his prophetic calling, he has a vision. And he says, I looked and a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. Each had four faces and each of them had four wings. The four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. So we've seen this before, um, this vision as it occurs in Ezekiel with the, the face of the human being, the lion, uh, ox, and the eagle. This is repeated in Daniel, it's repeated in uh, the book of Revelation, and later in uh, Christianity we've seen how those same four figures then are assigned to each of the evangelists in the canonical gospels of the Christian New Testament. So this is where this vision is having its origin. The grand divine creatures that he's seeing make up a structure of the cosmos and they also account for the heavenly motions. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. Their rims were tall and awesome for the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was something like a dome shining like crystal spread out above their heads. So this goes on in a lot of detail, um, but we'll just, uh, I'm just excerpting here. So above the dome of their heads, there was something like a throne in appearance like sapphire and seated above the likeness of the throne was something that seemed like a human form upward from what appeared like the loins, I saw something like a gleaming, something like gleaming amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all around, and downward from what looked like the loins, I saw something that looked like fire, and there was a splendor all around, like a bow in a cloud on a rainy day, so like a rainbow. Such was the appearance of the splendor all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So it's an attempt to create a very cosmic uh, conception of seeing the glory of the Lord as opposed to seeing the Lord who is unseeable. And so seeing the glory of the Lord connected here in a vision to the operations of the cosmos. So Ezekiel sees the same glory of the Lord that he identified that he saw in the vision on the plain. Um, when he sees then, he sees it in another vision, depart from the temple. Ezekiel is living in the exile time period when uh, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed and um, the exiles are taken to Babylon. He then also describes a vision of a restored temple. And in that vision, this future vision, he sees that the glory of the Lord re-enters the temple through the gate facing east. 
And so um, while God remains unseeable, the glory of the Lord is visible and is increasingly personified for prophets like Ezekiel who are seeing it sort of like a, something like a person and, and, and moving around, like going into the temple and leaving the temple and so forth. So Deuter Isaiah, this continuer of Isaiah after the exile, begins his continuation of the book of Isaiah with a prediction that, quote, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And this prediction that everyone will be able to see the glory of the Lord uh, as a personage becomes interpreted as a messianic prediction. And indeed, uh, the Gospels quote this passage as Christians interpret uh, this prediction in Isaiah as messianic and as um, uh, John the Baptist saying, you know, uh, quotes, quoting this to um, make way for the coming of the Lord, uh, this glory, uh, the personage of the Lord being the glory of the Lord. So equating the Messiah with the personage of the glory of the Lord. So similar to the glory of the Lord, which is seen, Biblical authors also refer to the word of the Lord, which is heard. And this is an even a much more frequent formula. So, for example, we hear that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And Samuel did not know, yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Um, so the word of the Lord is said uh, to come to various prophets. It's a regular formula. The word of the Lord appealed, appeared to the prophet Nathan, to the prophet Micah, and so forth. And uh, other prophets who are writing in their own kind of first person, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, describe occasions where the word of the Lord comes to them, and then they speak. So it is a very common formulation. Um, like I say, it appears hundreds of times in the prophetic texts. However, it's less personified than what we see with the glory of the Lord. And so actually it's usually referring in the text to the text which the individual prophets have composed rather than to a personification. However, um, that's a still a very common formulation. Like God's glory though, which like I can say is sometimes seen and personified, wisdom is personified in the biblical texts that are known as the Hebrew wisdom tradition or the Jewish wisdom tradition, since some of them are written in Greek. So for example, the book of Proverbs chapter eight envisions wisdom as a personage who gives a lengthy speech. I have some excerpts here excerpts here. And so the chapter begins, does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice? Besides the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the portals, she cries out. And this is her speech then to you, O people, I call and my cry is to all who live. O simple ones, learn prudence, acquire intelligence, you who lack it. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. She then describes, after more like that, she describes her background and says, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When he, the Lord, established the heavens, I was there, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. I was daily at his delight, I'm sorry, I was daily his delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. So wisdom here is a divine personage who is with the Lord prior to creation and who is also acting like a master craftsman aiding in the creation 
of the cosmos. Wisdom is also personified and is connected with the idea of the spirit of the Lord. It's another um, formulation of the Lord that is found in the Bible. So the spirit of the Lord is present at the beginning of creation as uh, moving upon the face of the waters and upon the face of the deep. Um, and so wisdom is, is connected with the spirit of the Lord in the Deuterocanonical book, Wisdom of Solomon. So this is scripture in the uh, Catholic and Orthodox churches, but not in Protestant Christianity or in uh, Rabbinic Judaism. So this was a Jewish text composed in Greek in Alexandria, either the first century BCE or the first century of the Common Era. And in this we read in the first chapter, Wisdom is a kindly spirit, yet she does not acquit blasphemous lips, because God is the witness of the inmost self and the sure observer of the heart and the listener to the tongue. For the spirit of the Lord fills the world, is all embracing and knows whatever is said. And so wisdom is a kindly spirit who is hearing all that God is hearing. So how do we make sense of all of these competing portraits, both the, um, kind of fleshy early anthropomorphic pictures of God, the more increasingly cosmic pictures, and then these um, formulations of God, the spirit of God, the word of God, the glory of God, God's holy wisdom that can sometimes appear as personifications of God, which are somehow different from God, <laughs> but uh, who is unseeable and unknowable, um, but in, uh, nevertheless, there is only one God. So having inherited all of these kind of competing and contradictory portraits from the diverse texts of the Septuagint, so all of these um, biblical texts that are translated into Greek, Jewish thinkers in the later Second Temple period attempted to produce a coherent theology using tools that they acquire from Greek logic and philosophy. And so there is a vast and probably the largest uh, Jewish community in the world is based in Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria is the capital of the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom and later it's brought into the Roman Empire as a uh, province of Egypt. Um, but throughout the entire Hellenistic period, Alexandria is essentially the intellectual and cultural center. So it is also the centers where the museum is, it's where the great library is. This is where um, both the uh, kind of great writers have moved to, but also the thinkers and philosophers. Uh, so Athens in the Hellenistic period is eclipsed, continues to have a school and so forth there, but the great uh, work or much of the great work is happening in Alexandria. And that continues even after the Roman conquest where Alexandria remains a really big city and also a culturally important city during the early empire. So Philo of Alexandria, we've had a whole lecture on him, is a uh, sophisticated Jewish thinker who does most of his reading and writing in Greek, um, including reading of the Hebrew Bible. He reads mostly in Greek. And his um, attempt to create a theology uh, using Greek philosophy and the tools of logic and Greek philosophy um, it may not have been the first, but it's the first that we have that uh, largely survives. And so um, in order to achieve what he does uh, and bring the Bible into a coherent theology, Philo uh, asserts essentially that allegorical interpretation is essential. Philo rejects the anthropomorphic depictions of God that biblical texts inherit from the early writers who are writing with a pre-monotheistic idea of Yahweh. And he does this by insisting essentially that these passages can't be read literalistically. So for example, um, when I talked to you before about breathing into uh, to the nostrils of the dust to bring Adam to life in Genesis 2-7, Philo says, now the expression breathe into, that's equivalent of saying inspired or 
give life to things inanimate. For let us take care that we are never filled with such absurdity as to think God employs the organs of the mouth or nostrils for the purpose of breathing into anything. For God is not only devoid of any qualities, but he is likewise not the form of man, and the use of these words shows some more secret mystery of nature. So, God doesn't have qualities. He, he certainly doesn't have human nose and mouth and so forth, and he doesn't do things like breathing. So, we shouldn't understand these literally. It's absurd to think so, Philo says. Rather, this uh, text is expressing something more mysterious and something that we should be uh, looking at more closely in order to understand creation. Similarly, concerning Genesis 2.8, when we talked about God planting a garden in Eden and later God walking around in the garden, Philo cautions his readers, let not such impiety ever occupy our thoughts as to suppose that God cultivates lands and plants paradises. We know that paradise, as I mentioned last week, is a, a, a loan word from Persian where the Persian emperors would plant gardens, and they're called paradises. Since if we were to do so, we should be presently raising the question of why he does so. For it could not be that he might provide himself with a pleasant places of recreation and pastime or with amusement. In other words, the Persian emperor makes paradises in order to have a place to hang out. He loves that. He wants to go hang out in them because he's a regular mortal king who can fit in a, in a garden. Let not such fabulous nonsense ever enter our minds, Philo says, for even the whole world would not be a worthy habitation for God, since he, God, is a place to himself. So rather than think that God would be in the world, we should be thinking of God more like we think of the world. And he himself is full of himself, and he is sufficient for himself, filling up and surrounding everything else which is deficient in any respect, or deserted or empty. But he himself is surrounded by nothing else, as being himself one and the universe. So, if anything, Philo is kind of saying we should be thinking of God more like, if we think of how big the universe is and how thing like that, that's how we should maybe start to get our hands around how big God is. God is much more like the universe than God is like man, but God is in fact not like the universe because the universe is filled with things that are deserted and empty and, and are contingent, but God is self-sufficient and, uh, and is actually sustaining everything else. So. Philo is, again, like I say then, rejecting literal interpretation of Scripture, the texts of the Hebrew Bible, in the Septuagint Greek translation, and instead he presents the God of Israel as the infinite cosmic source using technical philosophical terms that would be very familiar to the philosophers of his day. We call them Middle Platonists because Platonism evolved, has evolved at this time from what Plato originally taught several centuries earlier. And then there's the later Platonists and the middle Platonists are the Neoplatonists, uh, who were also influential uh, on Christianity later, but essentially Philo is running around at the time of middle Platonists. And so when he's saying things like that um, God is sufficient for God's self, so self-sufficient and, and so forth, this is a, um, a philosophical argument about uh, the divine that the philosophers, contemporary philosophers, are making. And in terms of making um, past traditional religious texts, if rereading those allegorically, um, Philo's allegorical interpretation of the Bible is really much in keeping with what uh, contemporary Greek philosophers are doing when they are taking their own mythological texts and reinterpreting them. So at the very foundation of ancient Greek religion and thought are the epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, which were composed orally and which are still, were still used um, kind of at the heart or uh, central, central to classical learning. But even so, as early as the 6th century BCE, 
Theogenes of Regium argued that when you're reading the struggle of the gods in the Iliad, that shouldn't be that shouldn't be read literally where the gods are coming down and taking part in a battle among humans and so forth. Rather, we should be reading those as an analogy of the way that the elements, air, earth, fire, and water, how they uh, are in opposition to one another. So it is telling some deeper mystery or truth about the physical universe, just the same way Philo is suggesting um, that uh, that the Bible is not talking about um, uh, a literal garden, but is suggesting some kind of deeper truth. Likewise, a guy named Prodicus of Cios in the 5th century um, BCE interpreted the gods in Homer as personification of substances. And so the god Demeter uh, is actually just bread. You know, when we think of bread, Dionysius is wine, Poseidon is water, Hephaestus is fire. So um, all of these substances that exist, the god is merely the personification of that entity or concept. So again, trying to come up with um, reinterpreting what had been sort of literal conceptions of anthropomorphic gods and thinking of them instead as broader, meaningful concepts. Plato, um, as among the philosophers who actually just wanted to just get rid of the traditional myths if possible, uh, because he suggested that you know, when you're having all these stories, uh, like a picture here of, uh, of Zeus who turns himself into a bull and takes, uh, abducts the maiden Europa uh, and rapes her, that these are totally unethical, all the things that uh, these myths portray about the gods. and. Plato's argument is the real gods wouldn't behave unethically. They would actually be the exemplars of, of the good and of ethics. And so that these um, uh, myths are, are detracting from uh, Greek religion and so forth, and they should probably be uh, eliminated or not taught. Um, and certainly tries not to teach them in his, in his Republic. He would prefer to that, that they're uh, suppressed. Um, so Philo follows in the same kind of path. So in his commentary on the creation story in Genesis, Philo rejects a literal reading of the text and interprets instead in the light of contemporary natural philosophy, what we now call science. And so, for example, that is rejecting um, the modern idea, fundamentalist idea of a young earth creationism, the idea that um, the earth is some crazy tiny amount of uh, years old based on a, a misreading, a literal misreading of the Bible. And so Philo says, it would be a sign of great simplicity to think that the world was created in six days, or indeed at all in time, because all time is only the space of days and nights, and these things, the motion of the sun, as the sun passes over the earth and under the earth, does necessarily make. So we only have day and night because of the sun moving around and so forth. But the sun is a portion of the heaven, so that one must confess that time is a thing posterior to the world. So in order for the whole cycle to be going and having day and night and so forth, you have to have creation first, he's saying, then we'll have time. So time is a thing that is something that happens after we have a sun and a moon in the world, according to uh, contemporary natural philosophy, Philo is arguing. Therefore, it would be correctly said that the world was not created in time, but that time had its existence in the consequence of the world, for it is the motion of the heaven that has displayed the nature of time. And so, according to Philo, the cosmos could not have been literally created in six days because there were no days until creation actually happened. The sun and the earth and time are actually all a part of creation and uh, occur after creation, uh, time only begins after creation uh, happens. And um, this is not um, as sophisticatedly argued here by Philo, um, but by the time we get to Augustine, Augustine treats this um, much more fully, and again argues that uh, God begins creation 
time is created as part of creation, and so God exists outside of time, uh, as opposed to, um, like again, creating anything in six days. So, like I say, instead um, of this literal reading, Philo offers a symbolic interpretation arguing that the text says six days in order to point us to a deeper mystery about the universe. So then number six and its various important, mathematically important properties. So Philo says six is the first number which is equal in its parts in the third, I'm sorry, in the half, the third, and the six parts, since it is produced by the multiplication of two unequal factors, two and three, so two times three is six, and, uh, and, and so forth. And so uh, it's divisible then by six, by two, and by three. It is also akin to the motions of organic animals. For an organic body is naturally capable of motion in six directions, forward, backwards, upwards, downwards, to the left, and to the right. And so it's because organic bodies, because the body, all of physical creatures can move in those different directions, six is, um, is uh, representing material creation and a representative of creation. So at all events, Moses, so Philo incorrectly thinks that Moses here has written uh, the book of Genesis, but that's what all people traditionally thought. Um, we've seen otherwise that uh, Moses is not a historical figure and is not the author of Genesis in previous lectures. So Philo thinks he is, but Moses desires to show that the races of mortal beings and also of all the immortal beings exist according to their appropriate numbers. Measuring mortal beings, as I've said, by the number six, and the blessed and immortal beings by the number seven. So seven is, a, is another special number, so six first, then seven, and seven is the number of divine things. So six represents mortal and seven immortal, and that's a symbolic mystery that is being um, expressed, according to Philo, in the Bible, uh, as opposed to that it was the earth is created in just six days, which he rejects as silly. So the word of the Lord as the Logos. So Middle Platonism saw God as the immovable and transcendent source of everything. And so um, the Middle Platonists had changed kind of what Plato had originally um, made as his kind of creation stories and instead identified that um, Plato's idea or form of the good is the greatest form. And so saw then the form of the good as the transcendent God, the source of everything. And then the Middle Platonists then saw creation as beginning with the first being that is separated out from the form of the good, from God. And this being is called the Demiurge. Plato understood the Demiurge a little differently than the Middle Platonists, but the Demiurge, which essentially means the divine craftsman, and it's then the craftsman that brings about the rest of creation. So in his theology, Philo equates the role of divine craftsman with the word of God, the Logos, and also with holy wisdom, who we already read in that long um, passage from Proverbs, is present at the creation uh, in the book of Proverbs, and of course the Logos, the word of God, when God says, let there be light, is present at, with God at the beginning in Genesis. And so, so again, God is still this um, transcendent, immovable source, as the rest of Middle Platonists understand, and now Philo is, is equating the Logos and wisdom with the uh, Platon Platonic Demiurge. So, so logos as the word, it also means a lot more. So in addition to meaning word in Greek, logos also means things like reason, logic, discourse, and more. And so this becomes a very important um, concept, the very first um, discernible being in creation uh, that is divine, that is apart from the unknowable source. So for Philo, the Logos is the firstborn of God, 
and ultimately the highest of the intermediate beings necessary to bridge the enormous gap separating humans from the infinite source. So Philo houses Plato's idea of the forms, so things like uh, justice or virtue, these infinite ideas or forms, those are ideas in the mind of the Logos for Philo. So Philo uh, writes, he explains this, the father of the universe caused him, the Logos, to spring up as the eldest son, whom in another passage Moses calls the firstborn. And he who is thus born, imitating the ways of the father, has formed such and such species, looking to his archetypal patterns. So making, creating all the different creatures based on the, the form of each of those uh, creatures. So in different texts, Philo calls the Logos God's eldest son, like we see here, God's unbegotten son, the holy wisdom, and all, which is also the daughter of God, the form of the forms. So when we're having these ideas or forms, the archetypal patterns, this is the pattern of all the patterns, the mediator between the creator and the created universe. So... Finally, uh, Philo also calls the logo, the logos, a divine hypostasis, which is a, again, very philosophically technical word that's hard to translate, but it means maybe being or personage, person. Um, again, the, the divine hypostasis that is second to the creator. So Philo's attempt to reconcile biblical text with Platonism this illustrates just one of the ways Jewish thinkers in the Second Temple period were embracing Hellenism, and certainly this vibrant intellectual community in Alexandria um, is one of the places where it would have been a hotbed for these kind of ideas. Nevertheless, the same philosophical tools were used by early Christians in their attempt to produce a systematic theology, and so the fact that Philo is having uh, his idea of Logos be a divine hypostasis. Likewise, Christians also identify the Logos as a hypostasis of God and ultimately come up with three hypostases, so creator, Logos, and spirit in the ultimate um, orthodox Christian uh, conception of God. The author of the Gospel of John, as we start looking at how the Christians are using these same ideas and tools, begins his text with a retelling of the creation story found in Genesis. And as we saw in Proverbs, it's also in Proverbs where wisdom is present with the Creator. So in the Gospel of John, we read, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. And so we can kind of see how this is, how we're understanding already hypostases, right? So just like wisdom who claimed to be in the beginning before creation started, before there was even time with God, uh, so too here now the word, the logos, is present with God, but uh, which is to say the creator, but the logos also is God, which is to say both the Creator and the Logos are hypostases of the one God. And then, as Wisdom said, when uh, Wisdom said she was with God at the very beginning, beside him and always as a master uh, artisan, uh, or as a demiurge, as a craftsman, as we saw in um, Platonism and Philo, uh, all of these things, as God is creating, come through this craftsman, the Logos that is there with. So this understanding that we have here, uh, this retelling of the creation at the beginning of the Gospel of John, that'd be pretty consonant with Philo, except for then that Christians take the idea of the Logos a step further by equating the Logos with a Messiah, the idea of the Messiah or Christ and also by identifying Jesus as the Christ and the Messiah and therefore the Logos, which Philo did not do or would not have done. So when Christians found themselves in the difficult tasks of how it could be 
that there is only one God, if somehow the Father, Christ, and the Spirit are all God, they were very lucky because they had inherited a lot of biblical precedent and also philosophical tools for understanding these three all as God, but as distinct from one another. So building on the idea that holy wisdom is God's word, God's logos, and can be a second hypostasis or person of God connecting the creator to the created, Christian theologians were able to develop a conception of one God with one divine essence, nevertheless made up of three distinct hypostases or persons. And I'll just add that since Christians generally equate holy wisdom with the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, Christ is therefore feminine as well as masculine. So we can think of uh, Christ, holy wisdom, and her daughters here. The same way, actually, that we always try to point out that the creator and the spirit transcend gender. So um, the creator is sometimes called the father or the heavenly parent, but can also be thought of as the womb of creation or heavenly mother. Those are all other ways of understanding it. Even uh, this is fully consonant, for example, with Orthodox and Catholic doctrine that, um, uh, that when God is creating humans, male and female, in God's image. The image of God, again, is the Logos. But anyway, that that, that is both genders are, are in God's image, which transcends uh, gender and so forth. Both genders and indeed all genders, since there's a, a um, uh, spectrum. Likewise, the spirit transcends gender. I've even said how we tend to say the spirit of God and use the pronoun it, but you can use he or she or they or however we want. So in other words, while Christians understand Jesus as Christ, the Christian conception of Christ as God's logos and as Hagia Sophia encompasses much more than Jesus in this uh, rich and expansive uh, prism through which Christians now traditionally understand the divine. And so that's my uh, take on holy wisdom and the logos. And hopefully this uh, will generate some uh, interesting conversation and comments. Let me have a little drink of water as Leandro gets me those questions. So um, let me begin by thanking people for uh, making donations, we appreciate it. So thanks to Brad Stewart and to J.R. Exner and to J.H.U.S. and J.M.U.S. Uh, J.R. says, thanks for sharing so much um, of our European world's folklore and ancient scholarship. Uh, J.H. says, oh, U.S., that's U.S. dollars. I get it, <laughs> sorry, Canadian dollars in U.S. So J.H. says, thank you, J.H. and J.M., J.H. says, your view of scripture and no-nonsense approach to the intersection of history and theology has renewed my faith in religious organizations. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy um, that that's the case. We are trying to um, have a no-nonsense uh, approach to history and theology and are trying to be um, a religious integrity, a religious organization with integrity. Uh, Ricky Palacios says, uh, how much of the epic of Atrasis and Gilgamesh influenced um, the wisdom and logos in Christianity? Um, so obviously, uh, Gilgamesh is like the one amongst the very earliest of all um, of all written epics, and so it is at the beginning of uh, of mythology. And because it's a, uh, it, it still remains central to uh, Mesopotamia um, and later Mesopotamian religions, there is some indirect connection between this earliest writings and um, when you're getting all the way to Christianity, Judaism, you know, and then via Judaism to Christianity. But I would say it's, 
it's very, very indirect. We just have so many more, um, by the time you get to Christianity, there are so many more uh, uh, direct precursors of the wisdom tradition in, um, uh, in Jewish tradition, and also uh, that is coming from you know, direct uh, connections with both the Egypt and also uh, Mesopotamia, and then also the Greek tradition. Uh, for logos. So I'd say that those are much closer than going all the way back to ancient Sumer. And so there might have been some very indirect, and it's a foundational um, foundation of getting the rock rolling in the tradition, but I would say it's not very um, influential in terms of directly. Um, Josh Terran says, did original Christians understand the Holy Spirit as a person? The Old Testament uh, clearly has it being God's spirit or power, so I wonder how spirit ends up getting thrown into a trinity. So, so we have to remember that I'm, I'm, we say the word person, but the word person is actually um, a technical, uh, philosophical uh, term, hypostasis, that, you know, is not necessarily meaning person the way um, we think of people. So we think of people as meaning humans. Uh, and so what I would say about um, the Holy Spirit as a person, it is a, uh, we, might, we might also say an expression of God that is distinct from the Creator and is distinct from the Logos. So the Spirit of God is another expression of God, but is usually not personified as a human-like being, when we're not supposed to do for God anyway, <laughs> you know, and so, and so that's why I say um, that continues to be the case. So this idea that the spirit of God is like the power of God, uh, and is it, that's also um, found in uh, some of the philosophy, competing philosophies too. So. Um, so the formulations of, of, of what the spirit is and how the spirit works into, um, let's say, the middle or neoplatonic worldview and also the, how the, um, the, uh, uh, the Stoics are identifying the, the world spirit and so forth as different. And I think that in some cases, I think that in Christianity, it's confused because we have so much inheritance. So we have like you say, a, a sort of dispersonified uh, uh, inheritance that's that has a lot of biblical precedent. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, Christian talk about it other than that, that Christ is giving you with the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit is present at the creation. The Spirit is, takes the form of a dove at, during the baptism of, of Jesus. Like I say, I'm actually intending... Um, to spend a little bit of time in the next year, really kind of getting a getting a handle on it myself and trying to decide what what do I really think about uh, the spirit as a uh, as a person in the Trinity? Because in a lot of cases, the spirit is a little bit of an afterthought. I think like in the Nicene Creed, like I say, we also believe in the Holy Spirit, but what do we believe? And so I'm wanting to explore that more myself. Um, Michelangelo. Michelangelo, I say, but anyway, Michael and Miguel Angel, <laughs> I'll say it one way or the other. What was the Jewish and Christian ideas about the relation of God and the concept of eros, which I think is a uh, complementary in Greek philosophy to logos, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there are a number of... Um, words for uh, like love in Greek. And so eros on the one hand is love, but it's also I think more desire. And the um, uh, when I was talking the pictures of um, the children of, of Hagia Sophia, one of them I identified as called we got faith, uh, hope, and it's actually said in the caption, faith, hope, and love, but I, Right, but I yeah, but I identified it as as charity because agape is a different concept of, uh, and a different word for love, and so I feel like um, I feel like uh, like Christians 
have really kind of focused on the other loves than eros love, but um, and so and so the other part of it is that's complex is that by putting um, uh, you know those personifications of of uh, wisdom's daughters and having one of them be love. I think that's a little theologically confusing because we actually identify, uh, I think, well, in, in any event, God, whichever per persona of God with love. Now, I don't know if it depends on, we have because we, there's a lot of phrases in, in, in the New Testament, for example, where we, we read that God is love. And so that's especially true in the Jahanine community. So that it says kind of almost, I think it directly it says that in the, in the epistles of John. And so, in that case, then we have to decide, um, does that mean we equate the creator with love, which I sometimes I think do. And so if we're thinking of the creator as the platonic form of the good or good for goodness sake, or the platonic form of love for love's own sake, um, so then the relationship of the logos to maybe not eros, but maybe to caritas, or what are you saying, agape um, in Greek, right? Agape, caritas, um, might be the relationship of the different persons of the Trinity. Um, and thank you for your support, uh, Michelangelo. <laughs> and thank you, Daryl, Scott, for your support. Daryl, you ask, um, when Yahweh's were polytheists and henotheists, um, did they have the same creation story that we have in the Bible now? So we have um, two creation stories, or actually we have more than two creation stories. We have two creation stories in Genesis, and we have a number of other creation stories in the Bible, actually. I mean, I read the one from Proverbs and the one from John, which is much later. Uh, we also have one, I think it's, it's, in, it's in the Psalms, I think, where, where God splits the beast in half, um, and that's a, an early creation story. So uh, no, they don't have the same creation story that we have now um, when, they were, when they were first polytheists. So the, the, the polytheist creation story is probably the one um, you know, of the, the, the great God creator that is fighting the primordial beast and splitting it apart and, and taking its body parts in order to make the, make the universe. Um, there's an echo of that. I think it's in Psalms, I had to look it up. Um, the, um, the, the story that, of the second, um, uh, second creation story in Genesis of God um, breathe, planting the Garden of Eden and, and breathing you know, into the dust and so forth, that's the Yahweh story. Yes, by that time, um, by that time the people are henotheists. Yeah, Leviathan, that's what I'm saying, the big creature is being, um, um, being done. But then uh, and that's, that one's from that. And then in terms of uh, the, the first story at the beginning of Genesis, the more cosmic story, the priestly story, it depends on when you think the priestly text of the Bible is written. A lot of people put that now in the post-exile period, and so they would be getting more towards monotheism by then. But if it's written before the fall, then they're henotheists still. Uh, Dave Anderson, thank you for your support. Uh, Julie Bazuski, um, did the idea of holy wisdom become associated with certain angels in Christianity? Um, well, so that would be what, when we see um, faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and charity in, the, you know, in that, those statues or in that icon, those would be angels. Because essentially, what, once you have these other qualities, these other um, platonic forms that are the you know, ideas of virtue and so forth, the cardinal virtues, those become associated with different levels of angels in Christology. And so essentially, angels are also not, we think of them entirely as um, humans with wings, right? But in, in fact, actually, they should be understood to be um, platonic forms like justice or something like that. And so in this particular case, um, holy wisdom is, asso is associated in Christianity with three of those angels, uh, hope and joy, 
and, and charity or love. Um, Paula Strange says, in my mind, holy wisdom seems like both the spirit and like Christ as the logos, and I'm a little confused. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, the, the, I, like I said at the beginning of this, it's not entirely fixed. So some Christians do see uh, holy wisdom as the spirit instead of seeing holy wisdom as the logos. It's a minority position, but some do. So I think the problem with it is, and why, why they especially haven't, is that um, holy wisdom is very clearly personified in that Proverbs story. That Proverbs story is, um, in, in the Proverbs creation story, is, is very directly repurposed in um, the Gospel of John, which definitely says, identifies that being as the logos, as opposed to, and so that the logos is wisdom. And I think that's why, uh, and there's actually a lot of other places where um, Jesus is associated with wisdom. And so I think that's why um, uh, the, there is a lot of biblical support for connecting the logos and Christ to wisdom. Um, it's confusing. I think it's confusing because we need to really flesh out it to say not not literally obviously the spirit <laughs> so because the spirit uh we haven't gone through and in, in my opinion done a lot of get our hands around what are we exactly we are meaning by the spirit i think that's why you're confused and i'm confused uh luminal mind how does the greek word pneuma as in breath slash spirit fit in here i woke up uh, one morning with the phrase deep peace in the pneuma of now in my head and there's very little on pneuma. So so the pneuma is the Greek word for spirit and that is the same word for breath. And so that's the same spirit is our word spirit is derived from the Latin word that means the same thing. Ruach in Hebrew. And so those are all the words for spirit. And so um, so you're using the word pneuma uh, uh, when you're thinking, and we have this um, um, mantra that you have in your head, deep peace in the Newman of now, that is um, another way that you're identifying spirit. And so, yes, and it's, um, in its original form, the original idea, back going back to pagan times, is that uh, the difference between a live body and a dead body, there's really almost can be, no, unless unless somebody died of some terrible wounds or something like that, if you just die uh, without any seeming physical cause, the only difference between before and after you died is that you're no longer breathing. And so somehow having a breath or spirit in you is what is making you alive in the original kind of pre-world um, religion uh, conception. And, and the world religions are... Our, our, um, and, and Greek philosophy are, are drawing from that early preconception. And so the word breath or pneuma is where people are first getting that idea of, of spirit. So it becomes, instead of being about air, it becomes, uh, in Greek philosophy, an, the immaterial mind, which is to say all of the things that... Um, make you you that are not your physical you know your physical body so this mind um, mind body problem of Greek philosophy um, Philip Denoto thank you for your support um, uh, says all that is needed for peace is the will to envision it and so yes we are um, praying for peace and we would like to envision that and also have the peoples of the world will it as we continue to uh, live in times that are, do not have peace. Mike Rogers says, why is the spirit portrayed as male in the restoration tradition? Um, so it sometimes is, and the reason why um, uh, Latter-day Saints sometimes think of the spirit as male is because uh, a lot of Latter-day Saint tradition, especially from the 1830s and 1840s, Joseph Smith's time period is pretty sexist, and so they have a male-only priesthood. Um, they can't conceive of a 
uh, Godhead as having members that don't have priesthood. And so um, there is a, uh, because of the late, no, Joseph Smith's late Nauvoo theological speculation that, there, that God is not infinite, that God is simply a finite physical being, and that Jesus is a completely uh, distinct non, non-God but divine physical God with a low G, uh, exalted being that is separate from the exalted being of the Father, then the idea is that the Spirit is a, a third part of that presidency uh, who has not been embodied yet, but someday will. And so then a bunch of different um, Mormons speculated or have said that they are the Holy Spirit incarnate. So some people speculated, well, is, is James Drang now the embodiment of the Holy Spirit? I don't think he claimed that. But some, some of the different um, leaders have kind of claimed that. And so that's where that idea comes from. Um, so it is a, a literalization of the persons of the Trinity Eliminating the Trinity, eliminating um, uh, speculation, theological speculation that eliminates the idea of an infinite God, uh, re- uh, rejecting the idea of uh, the infinite God as the source of all, and instead having the divine beings um, be within a larger divine plan. Daryl Scott says, is wisdom feminine in the original Hebrew Proverbs? So. Perhaps not, because I think that actually the word for wisdom uh, in Hebrew is is not feminine. And so, um, but I used the feminine version because uh, Philo and the Christians are not working from the original Hebrew. Um, they are being, in, they are being um, influenced by the Greek, which is more important. So the Greek is the uh, scriptures of... Uh, for the for both the Alexandrian Jews and also for uh, Christians who were really not going back to the Hebrew initially. Uh, Leon Berg says, in U.S. English, both Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost are used in religious context, but ghost might refer to dead folks. In the original languages, the ref- is, was the reference only to the divine? No. Um, so I think both Spirit and ghost can refer to dead folks in English. So um, if spirits are walking the earth or something like that, I think you'd understand that as being a dead person or dead creature or something like that. The spirit, the former spirit of a formerly embodied being who has now died. So, um, so no, it's the same. The idea, and so this is a connection uh, again when we're as we're trying to grasp our, um, you know, this. Uh, this lecture is actually on wisdom and the logos, but you guys are all crying out for a lecture on the spirit, right? So none of this is about the spirit, guys. So yes, this is a connection where, between humans who have spirits and God's spirit. And so this is one of the ways that, um, so the creator is the, uh, is the most distant from connecting to human, un- unknowable, unseeable, and so forth. Uh, the logos, is seeable and um, can be experienced as God's glory and, and so forth. Uh, uh, and it's also, we become part of Christ, for example, in Christianity when, when we become part of the body of Christ. And so that is a connection between, the, uh, with, between creation and the creator. But the spirit also is going to have another one of these connections because of the idea that the spirit of God, that God has a spirit, it is spirit, and the idea of humans having spirit. And so this is a connection um, that you've identified here bet- uh, that between the Holy Spirit and spirits uh, as understood in the Islamo-Judeo-Christianity. Um, Michelangelo says, was holy wisdom also the origin of Sophia from Gnosticism? So yes. So the Gnostic Christians are also drawing from this tradition. They are also very excited about the wisdom tradition specifically. And they are also um, very excited about Middle Platonism. And so they are taking um, Platonic um, Platonist uh, conceptions of creation and they are creating uh, elaborate mythologies 
in the various Gnostic uh, secret gospels and things like that, that that are allegories for how they understand the world coming into being, where um, emanations from the Creator uh, are, you know, with Sophia being one of the main characters in this um, Gnostic creation story, uh, where that is. Um, uh, is being central to their tradition. And so, yes, it's absolutely interconnected. It's the same thing. So Leon also asks, if these ancient folks viewed wisdom as a feminine trait and word as a male, was Jesus considered a man filled with wisdom? Um, so, so Jesus, the human Jesus, is male. You know, and so, and when I walked around, the world was male. Um, and the original ancients, as we've said, seen before, were probably uh, adoptionists who um, understood, only understood Jesus to be the Son of God, or the you know to have been um, created as as uh, adopted as God's logos after the defeat of death through resurrection. But it's later, as the development of uh, the idea of Trinity happens, that there's a, a more expansive concept of, of uh, the Logos of Christ, of Christ as a, and the Logos as wisdom. So, so it's not so much... Um, so whereas we often focus our attention uh, in church on Jesus during his... Uh, mortal, mortal ministry or during his ministry on earth before the resurrection, um, that's not as important. Um, that's where we get teachings and things like that, but it's not as important conceptually to um, the concept of Trinity in terms of understanding uh, Christ as God. And so so I'm less I'm less worried about whether there's female spirits inside a male body or anything like that. Rather, God transcends gender is how I would say that. Um, lots of suggestions. Uh, there's been a lot of requests for a lecture about the spirit. Okay, well, we'll do that. <laughs> so definitely all your guys' questions were about the spirit, and so I, I agree with you that that's, um, we should do that so that I, I can look at more how different ancient thinkers have looked at that. And by the way, um, Origin will talk about it. Our lecture next week is is on origin. Origin is going to give us our first uh, glimpses into that, and so I'll do a little focus on that as one of the uh, whatever origin has to say. I'll, I'll have that be one of our focuses next week. Um, Michelangelo also said it would be cool to have a future lecture about the history of Alexandria. I agree that would be really important because um, Alexandria is very important. And Leandro wants one about Antioch. <laughs> Antioch is also a, a very important uh, cultural center in the Hellenistic world in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Uh, Paula Strange says, um, evolution of the idea of, a subs uh, of this substitutionary atonement. So that's an idea for a lecture, right? So you want to talk about um, the evolution of the ideas about atonements, including uh, the substitution theory. Uh, that would be a good topic for a lecture since um, atonement is very complicated. Uh, a lecture about how the cult of saints starts and an exploration of rabbinic Judaism from its start and through to the Middle Ages. So those would be all great topics. So thank you. Yeah. So I appreciate all of those. Are you going to give me anything else, Lynn? Okay, that's it. So thank you so very much. Um, this was, whenever we do these um, kind of theology topics and things like that. It's always a little bit, we have to talk about hypostases and so forth. And, but I, so I appreciate you all waiting through this with me. And we will see um, what a very brilliant, the first genius Christian theologian had to say about all of this next week when we talk to about, when we hear about origin.